giving up. Just, um, I'm not going to serve on any more committees. I'm not going to be on the bishop's campaign. I just, I can't do it anymore. Or, I'm going to another faith community because the scandals have been way too much for me. And they've affected my family, maybe not actually, uh, in, in terms of a family member being a victim, but other ripple effects. And others are standing firm. And why and how and to what end are those persons standing firm? And I would simply say, these are not new problems. The whole question of women in the church has been with us for quite a while. And of course, uh, the rising of feminism across Western culture in the last 50 years has only increased that. And I have a flashback, you may not remember this, but a Christmas morning during the pontificate of Pope Benedict. And Pope Benedict at the Christmas midnight mass was processing down the endless um, nave of St. Peter's when a woman leaped out of the pew and knocked him over. <laughs> and if you were up early Christmas morning, you heard about it. So I had an aunt. She had no children, but she sort of mothered all of us. And she was being cared for at the infirmary of the Sisters of Mercy in Pittsburgh. And my sister of mercy, sister and I, were sitting at Christmas breakfast with her and said, Aunt Irene, did you hear that last night some woman knocked over the Pope? <laughs> and she said, well, it's about time. <laughs> now, I would say Aunt Irene was usually politically correct and uh, not somebody that you would consider a radical uh, feminist in church concerns, but uh, she was beginning to lose the boundaries of appropriate response. But I always wondered, was that the real response <laughs> of a woman who was very much aware <clears throat> of women's status, having worked in, uh, in uh, you know, many corporate situations and county services? And this was a real response for me at time. So we also look at the current climate. We see sometimes an apparent, and I say apparent because it's not always easy to judge this, an apparent lack of interest and support from the hierarchy. And that can be very different in different dioceses or different regions of the church. There has been a serious study of women being ordained to the diaconate, holy orders, initiated under Pope Francis, but it appears stalled. Is it just the pandemic? Is there something else going on that they have not reconvened? Because they could not come to a unified conclusion. And that was the reason Gibby for ending that initial consultation, but a new one hasn't been called for. And younger women, sad to say, are moving away, not just younger women. Um, I'll speak a little later of Carrie Alice Robinson, who spoke to our National Franciscan Assembly last year and said, we cannot lose another generation to our church. What are we doing about it? I was the first woman appointed to a chancery level position in the Diocese of Pittsburgh in 1972, six years after the Second Vatican Council closed. And that was a result of the fact that religious women in a diocesan synod had begged to have a woman in that office who understood the nature of women's religious life in a very, very turbulent time. And I would also say to you that I most likely got the job because almost no other women thought it would count for anything. So there was a real mistrust that you could be in that position and do any good. So uh, it wasn't like I was chosen from a field of strong, vibrant candidates. I was 
naive enough to go in and say, yeah, I'll take it. But I had a very, very marvelous educational experience and worked with a bishop who would never rank among the intellectuals of the church that he, his pastoral sense was extraordinary. I then, much later, went to Rome to finish my Franciscan studies and ended up being the first woman to earn a doctorate in the Franciscan University from Rome. And I just need to tell you that 30% of the faculty were applauding me, and 60% of that faculty were like, hey, you know, she's an American and she doesn't always dress like a sister. So, but again, I wouldn't have traded it for the world because it put me in touch with living in the church of center of gravity. 1988, I came home. I was elected the general superior of my congregation, then its headquarters were in Pittsburgh. That put me into the leadership conference of women religious. And just as I was about to leave office, Pope John Paul II, now St. John Paul, issued the decree that the question of ordination for women was off the table. And so leadership, women in leadership, were of course incredibly distracted about this. But we decided to take an alternative path, not one of public dissent and outrage, but to say, wait a minute, aren't there places in the church for people who aren't ordained? Aren't there offices that might even be better filled by people who weren't trained and prepared for pastoral responsibilities. So we prepared a document of 15 proposals to be presented to our bishops. I would say to you that we can come back to this in the question and answer uh, session, that that document didn't go very far. And it's not only because the bishops didn't follow up, religious leadership didn't follow up with a meaningful plan for its implementation. So you can write all the documents you want, but you don't have a strategy to get people to sit down and talk about them. They'll sit on the shelf. I have a copy here if you'd like to see. A future church, if those of you may be in touch with that organization, did take it up. Then, in 1999, I came uh, to St. Bonaventure University. I was just so eager to get back to my teaching and my studies of uh, Franciscan life. And within two years, I was back being an administrator, the director of all the Franciscan Institute, and again, the first woman ever to hold an appointment in what had always been reserved for prior scholars. And that led to, in 2004, uh, I became the first permanent woman president at St. Bonaventure. There had been an interim president, a renowned Sister Alice Gallon, for one year, but I was the first permanent leader. So I have been breaking the stained glass ceiling for a lot of years, and it wasn't necessarily my goal. And especially when I would be invited to conferences on women, in higher education and they would say, Sister, you know, tell us, how did you achieve this, um, you know, this, this wonderful breakthrough of being the first woman at St. Bonaventure University? I said, I'm not your role model. I was running the other way when they called me for the interview. I really wanted to get back to my work with Franciscan studies that became so clear that this was God speaking through the wonderful Bonaventure community to me, like, no, please, make this, make this break for the sake of uh, what was needed at that time. I will say to you that that doctorate was a study of the role of St. Clair of Assisi. So I'm just going to say to you that one of the ways in which that study has helped me enormously, and of course she's not alone in leadership. Yesterday we had the Feast of Catherine of Siena. But what most people don't realize is that Claire lived for 27 years after Francis died. 
And through those 27 years, she was in constant tension with church leaders. And so what I realized is, you know, this, these are not new problems. We've been at this movie for a number of years. It's a, it's a lot of time. So her gospel practice, though, allowed her to overcome. So one good example is her respectful opposition to papal interference with the way in which she was creating a very new kind of religious community, one without property, and one in which the sisters would support themselves by their work, their manual labor, their interactions with the town of nursing or midwifery or whatever. And so Agnes Croft was, I only say, if you want a comparison, think Princess Diana or Princess Kate. Agnes Croft was a fabulously wealthy dynastic princess who decided to reject offers of marriage and establish a monastery of nuns to follow the rule of Claire. Who did not want Agnes to follow the rule of Claire? The oak. Because her wealth would be given away in service to the poor and not preserved for the church. So he tried his best to discourage her. And we have the letters that Claire sent to her saying, she's very careful. No matter who advises you, hold firm to that which you are doing. And then Agnes was finally able to adopt Claire's program because her brother was a king. And her brother, the king, wrote to the Pope and said, would you just stop? Stop interfering with my sister, you know, respect her, and the politics of the time of that was prevailing. So what did I take away from looking at Claire very closely for a long time? First, she prevailed because her motives came from the gospel. This wasn't about I have to be prevailed. I must overcome. She respected church offices. She and Francis had a profound grasp that the church itself is an extension of the incarnation, and as such, it has all the perils of humanity and all of the beauty and triumph of humanity. But to try to tear the church apart is simply not an option. It is the way Jesus left us a structure to stay in line with humanist teaching. And she worked to retain the relationship of being a sister to her brothers, even when they were in profound disagreement. And she, in general, managed to be able to do that. So, um, and, and there are some very touching stories of uh, this same Pope, when he was a cardinal, uh, wrote her a letter about he had spent a time at the Feast of Easter in the monastery of San Fabiano, or ministering to the sisters. And he wrote a beautiful letter about the way in which she inspired him. And, and, and he was saddened when he left their conversations, and he, he really was holding on to her advice. And yet, in terms of policy, they were miles away. And so they found a way to hold faith with one another from their shared love of Christ and of the church. Now, let's fast forward to the 20th and 21st century. I firmly believe that with the problems that we are recognizing, um, it, women, whether they're acting alone, working in an organizational form always have to choose the path that they think will result in the best and lasting change or even in a temporary change depending on the circumstances. And that question of discerning the path is really, really real. So I'll just go back to the experience of not so long ago, when you may remember that the Vatican took a big move against 
uh, the autonomy and the work, all the leadership conference of women did in this country. And they basically put the conference under the supervision of a bishop, which meant he had to approve the speakers who came to the conferences and you know, did bylaws need to be changed, there weren't the officers, the right people, and so on and so forth. It was devastating because it spoke of such distrust. And while it, I mean, this has happened before where the Vatican has come and said to the bishops, for example, which you meet with all the religious, we don't understand the way the American sisters have changed. You know, send us a report. But this was big, and this was public, it was international. And it was actually handled very constantly. It came out from the Vatican before the president of the LCWR had even been notified that this would happen. So, you know, you know that, you know, maybe a communications office person leaked it, but in any event, it just set up a horrible thing. What the LCWR did was it chose what they considered a contemplative stance about how to choose to respond, and out of that stance, designed a series of guiding principles, including not doing anything that would invite others to want to publicly disengage or dissent or create more problems, not to do anything that would pour gasoline on a fire. They did not give responses or press interviews during the whole time. And they made choices which no matter how they were being treated, they would work for a resolution that did not further alienate not just sisters, but lay Catholics. We had a, a group of our alumni on campus, and some of you may remember the name Jimmy Satton. He was one of our coaches for a while. Jimmy's wife came up to me and said, Sister, I said to Jimmy, hide the newspaper. If the kids find out the Vatican is after the nuns, it's over. <laughs> and I think actually one of the interesting uh, outcomes of that experience was as tough as it was for us, between us and the Vatican, our Catholic Church here in the States, after a couple of months, rose up and did everything that it could to support us. We were invited to seminary dinners and to honors events, and you know, people were anxious to let us know we're with you. So in some ways, it, uh, it kind of showed that the people understood that yes, we had made changes, and not every change had been so beneficial necessarily, or worked to increase our numbers, but those changes allowed us to be more thoroughly engaged in the needs of people and of the times. So, I want to go on now and talk about who are the women of our time that, for me, show a choice of action and leadership that gives me hope, and that I think sharing that hope is an essential ingredient uh, in order to move forward in a collective way. We need faith, hope, and love, but we also need imagination. And not everyone can imagine the structures or strategies that can move us forward. Many of these women did that. I want to start with Carrie Robinson, that should be a WR on state. Carrie, if you are not familiar with her, is the president of an organization called the Leadership Roundtable. The Leadership Roundtable started in Boston as a response to the clerical abuse situation that blew up in Boston back in around 2000. And as you will remember, that was, you know, it was a lightning bolt that hit the entire American church. And sadly, the lightning bolts keep coming to as if only they have heard the last, um, something else is revealed. So we're suffering in the shadow of the scandal. 
So Carrie and a group of leaders, she worked in, she had this ministry at Yale. Uh, she and other leaders, most of them Catholics, who were the type of Catholic that was a major donor to the, to the, uh, to the diocese or uh, leaders of corporations or colleges and universities or whatever, came together and formed uh, a way to respond. And I'm just going to read a quote that describes the way in which they wanted to frame that work. She said, we planned and hosted a three-day conference, governance, accountability, and the future of the church. This was our church. Listening to victim survivors was the first step. Understanding the problems at hand was the second step. Committing to being part of the solution was the third step. And commitment to that was our fourth step and has been ever since. Participants left with the sense that it was possible, even if very difficult, to help call the church to greater levels of accountability and holiness. And here in Buffalo, we had a counterpart in the movement to restore trust. Carrie, I met her for the first time in the panel discussion at Canisius that opened up that work. Since then, the Leadership Roundtable has committed to assisting dioceses engulfed by the scandal to help them learn better methods of, first of all, financial transparency, internal governance and administration, the skills which are not necessarily the curriculum of many church leaders because the seminary curriculum has focused on theological, pastoral, philosophical training. So you invite a man to take over a diocese with complex financial and administration problems and may cover six counties, and you're surprised when things don't go well. So they are trying to shore up those structures of diocesan life in order for the people to feel more confident in their future. Monica Hellweek is deceased. Monica was a lay theologian. and she was for a period of time a medical missionary for Africa, but she was drawn to the academic life in a very strong way. She departed the community, earned her doctorate, and eventually she became the president of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities. And the reason she is here is that for 10 years, the Catholic Colleges in America were in attention with the Vatican. What was the attention? The Vatican issued the document called From the Heart of the Church, it's core day of Ecclesia, that gave guidelines for being sure that we were preserving the Catholic identity of our schools. Now, I can tell you, it wasn't a bad idea to ask us to be accountable, to take a hard look and ask, could we do better? But, one of the elements of that document was to insist that if you were teaching theology or religious studies in the Catholic institution, you had to receive a kind of a license from the mission, which could allow I hope you won't be too offended or surprised that a bishop who perhaps wasn't keeping up with the latest theological studies could easily denounce or, you know, insist on the removal of a faculty member based on, you know, his personal evaluation. And what the ACCU had to do was to explain to the Vatican officials, you don't understand. In America, separation of church and state, our colleges are governed by a board of trustees. They are the ones responsible. And if, as let's say, Bonaventure or Canisius or Roche, there are religious found at the college and they still participate in administration and governance, they are the key people. 
they ask those questions? Well, you know, nobody in Europe necessarily likes to take lessons from Americans. You know, like we always walk in the room like we've got this. Ten years. And in those ten years, Monica was the one constantly at the table saying, We really, we really do need to understand how we're going to work on this. And working with American officials to say, and at the end of the day, you're going to have this right. But we ask you to be very, very, very careful about how you exercise. And at that time, our official was still official himself. And he was very, very careful. And Bishop Kimmy was very, very careful. And so uh, I think we had no major issues. I see John is here. John may have inside information from up here in the city. I don't know. But we were very fortunate. Some other colleges had some very serious uh, setbacks because of that. A few others. Sister Anne Nassimiu Masiki was from a congregation of African women. She came to the United States to study theology, and she did her doctorate at Duquesne University, so she lived in the mother house of our sisters for a period of time. I got to know her a little bit then. Later, Anne was not only Dr. Anne Nassimiu Masiki, she became the general minister of her sisters, and the two of us landed on an international commission in Rome together. And that's what we really got close to. Anne was not afraid to confront clerical abuse, not only of minors, but of religious women. That was the horrible secret in many parts of Africa. And she confronted bishops. And in one case, she actually warned the bishop the next time this happened to one of her sisters, she would go to the press. The bishops of her region saw to it that she didn't get reelected for the second term. So it stirred the plot in the congregation. So she wasn't there. But she went on with her work. And when she died, she was written up internationally as a voice for the protection of women from abuse, from clerical abuse, and for that reason, seen as a kind of firebrand, and always kept at arm's length when she could have been leading the women in that whole continent. Sister Margaret Brennan, also deceased. Margaret Brennan was the superior of the Immaculate Heart Sisters in Monroe, Michigan, right when all of the changes that came to religious life following the Vatican Council were causing not only turbulence inside the congregations, but turbulence outside. And um, as you may recall, uh, the sisters certainly know this, there was literally a split taking place with the sisterhoods that were interested in American reform and renewal, and the sisterhoods that felt strongly that we should not abandon the kind of monastic traditions of the habit of the full divine office of living in very large mother house communities, etc. And it's a very, very painful time, right? Inside communities and on the larger scene, but Margaret Brennan would literally, with all she had to do, go and sit with individual bishops and cardinals, Cardinal Rome in particular, because the epicenter of that more traditionalist resistance was in eastern Pennsylvania, and talk through with them. You know, we're doing, we think we're doing what the council invited us to do. So please don't get into a position where you pit us one against the other. And uh, you know, her name was never on lights in a large way, but I was reminded just the other day by a little write-up on her that she and, and she went, she went to the meetings of the more traditionalist groups and sat in dialogue. That she put herself to extraordinary extra labor 
in order to try to keep a bridge uh, between those two. And that, that separation still exists, but there continue to be bridge building exercises. And of course, oh, and bridge on, she's next. I don't need to say anything about her, but she may be one of the very few women who can honestly say that she has helped to change church, church teaching and it's the teaching on the death. So you'll be able to hear from her about that experience next week. Now, I would say the other big source of hope is what Pope Francis is doing. So let's take a quick look at this. Then enough. Early in his papacy, he was in seemed to be, I mean, he's so outgoing and he's so modern and he's moved to this little apartment, but he doesn't seem to be focused on anything for advancing women, so there was a bit of a, uh, you know, we're, we're still stuck. Then, he clearly, quietly acted to end this tension between what has been called in the past the holy office, the office of Catholic doctor, and in the leadership in America. It ended with a very fraternal, sororal meeting with our leadership, and pretty much said that we're places of the bank or whatever. The other thing he did from early on, though, was there were gestures that said something about who he was. Washing the feet of women. Do you remember when that thought to be a controversy? The bishops were afraid of white women's feet on Holy Thursday. He washed the feet of a Muslim woman. Oh my God, what's happening to the church? You know, and that's a real reaction. And there are consequences. New activity. Um, every few years, the International Union of Religious Superiors gathers in Rome, and um, they have one meeting with the Pope that just goes for one or two hours. The last time they met, in the audience hall, they had a, like a desk and a chair set up for the Pope. And before he began his remarks, he called the aid over, brought up another chair, and had the president come and sit beside him. It was worth 70,000 words in terms of a gesture of respect. That she was the lead, and he had been invited, you know, as the successor leader to meet with his sisters. Uh, I should also say in this regard, Carrie Robinson and a small circle of women from the leadership round table, and I didn't list this, have over the years had multiple confidential meetings with bishops and cardinals who had key Roman offices. And they go because they are invited to come to help them better understand what is it that women in the Western world, you know, are looking for from the church. And once when Carrie spoke about that in a public lecture, people said, well, what's that like? It's very good. There's no publicity. Nobody's got a published press release. And so there's a very candid exchange. And many of these men really do want to know because they've not been brought up in a society like ours. And so it's not about church doctrine as much as it is about the cultural, sociological differences between a society like ours. So, and, and recently, and when the, the lay women, you know, national councils of Catholic women come together in Rome, there is a similar audience with Pope Francis and with his princess. Now, he's making appointments that are really shaking things. So, let me give, and, and I'll name some of the people he's appointed. And, uh, just one last thing, when he published this last encyclical, its title was, <laughs> Friends, I mean, two, two, all my brothers. They got seven. Oh, here we go again. Pope is only talking to the men. Here's the problem. He started with a quote from St. Francis of Assisi. And the quote he chose was Francis, 
talking only to his partners. What kills me is two subway stops from the Vatican is a monastery filled with Franciscan experts who could have shown you three or four quotes where the Pope speaks to women and to men, or where Francis spoke to both women and men. But because it began with that quote, everybody got the wrong idea, you know, that, that he's not moving along. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, I would say the fault there was his advisors, not calling somebody who could have helped find words of Francis that were more egalitarian. So he is currently placing women in major church structures. And I think what this reveals about him is his Jesuit discerning way of doing work. We are told that he studies issues intensely, and he brings a series of people in to give him advice. He explores options, and then he acts. So he wasn't doing this in his first year. And now he's reforming the structure of what we call the Roman Curia, which means the court, which is like the county officials of the papacy. So who is he appointing? Synod bishops. So we know this synod is a very big deal because the goal of Francis is every single person in the church should have an opportunity to be part of the consultations on the synod. But he has appointed a sister from France, Natalie Bequard, as the undersecretary, and she will have the right to vote. Up until now, he had to be a bishop to have the right to vote. And what I think is especially exciting, her whole ministry as a religious woman has been so she's very aware of younger generations and what their hopes and aspirations are. He has also appointed Miriam Bilgens as an advisor, and she is a professor of canon law and theology. She's from Holland, and she's teaching in Germany. So now you have a woman able to provide a theological and even a canonical law point of view to any of the changes that the Synod will take. Christy Ann Murray, you probably never heard of her. She's the vice director of the Vatican Press Office. When I lived in Rome, uh, the sister who had the room next to me, an American from my hometown of Pittsburgh, uh, was on the staff of the official Vatican newspaper called the Observatore of Romano. And she did the translations into English for the English edition. So they did people in Rome. So when people would say, well, what do you do there? The answer, she said, I keep the Pope infallible in the English language. <laughs> but because of her, I got a really wonderful understanding of reading the hard work of the Vatican Press Corps and the, the kind of high wire that they want. And finally, there is a Vatican Council on the Economy, and six women are on that. Women economists are on that. And most recently, and maybe the most important, the Pope has just issued new directives to reform the offices of the Roman Catholics. And it has made very clear that lay women and lay men can and should be sharing in the governance and administration of the church at that level. This is major because until this time, you can only hold a post of governance in the church at large if you are ordained. Now, for women, religious, you hold a post of governance because the sisters allowed you, and it's in turn. In men's religious orders, if you are a lay brother, some of you know Brother Ed Conlon, who's now in heaven, you can't be elected to the top security because you're not ordained, even if you could do the job for him. So what is happening is, Pope Francis is laying the groundwork to separate governments from the whole. And that doesn't mean it should not be priests, 
who are qualified and might be the best person, but it also means that the laity who have skills and knowledge that often are, are not exactly the same uh, as those in holy orders can come and help and bolster the work of the church. And in a recent conference with women, uh, the Pope literally said to them, you know, uh, you've got to raise your voices when you are mistreated. Then you have every right to because you want to be of service, but you should not be reduced to servitude in your work in the church. And that was quoted in a recent release by Catholic News. So, what is the community of faith for women of tomorrow? I think that we see in every age women, despite enormous difficulties and sometimes upright persecution from within the church, may change of faith. And we see in our own age massive change, but it's not recognized in our culture or the press. So, all of those changes that I just listed. There's no headline in the Buffalo News. I don't think the New York Times is going to help with it. So the people who set the table for what news gets reported, and I just learned the other day with a professional journalist that it is the New York Times that sets the table. Uh, that when they meet every morning, the results of their meetings go out to every AP outlet in the country. So everybody knows who the Times is going to talk about. So, but we don't see this reflected. And, and so as North Americans, we tend not to understand some really important stuff that is going on. And, but, but we do have some organizations, the Leadership Roundtable, Future Church, monitoring. And I also think that we can find allies and methods to sustain a gospel stance of faith group the time. And so, questions guaranteed, answers not guaranteed, but we'll do our best. Thank you very much. So where is Michael? Michael, are we able to take a few minutes? Yes, you are. Okay, Michael, time, because I realize people have other things to do and places to go. So if you've got to some places to go, you could do it right now, but we won't go for your 10 minutes, okay? Questions and comments? Yes, go on. Margaret, thank you. You did not disappoint. No, you know, I had no doubt. But, uh, when we were uh, thinking about establishing the movement to restore trust, we consulted with you, and there was considerable pressure then uh, from several quarters, people, uh, and mostly women, trying to tie the virgin sex abuse scandal <clears throat> to the church's stance on the ordination of women. And I remember you giving us some very sage advice, uh, born out of your experience with the LCWR, uh, about efforts on that issue and how it is an absolute non-starter. And I just wondered whether you could share a little bit of that experience. Okay, thank you so much, John. Um, for example, I, I will say a little while ago, and we friends from Molly and Jane Snodgrass, who is our Episcopal pastor, going and work with Father Greg and myself and his wife, Kathy, person. Um, in the Episcopal Church, people in the Episcopal Church have said to me on more than one occasion, because of the number of women we have as pastors and now as bishops, this would never get to this point. We don't think. It's not that we have no examples. But the women closed in on it quickly. So that was one of your starting points in the movement to restore trust. The dilemma for the ordination of women is that John Paul clearly set down as policy that this is not a question open to debate and development. However, Francis did open the question of ordination to Diana. And it's a really, really important step, and that's why I worry that we're not quite sure whether it's dead in the water or it was hurt enough by the pandemic. But the dilemma becomes if you want to say ordained women in the Catholic Church and then we don't have clerical abuse, you've already started with an argument 
that the clergy, the bishops, can't respond to if they want to be seen as faithful to what the current church policy is. On the other hand, the 15 recommendations we made back in 96-97 were all very crystal clear about ways that women could be placed in leadership roles in the diocese of chancery, and there are not many. There are women who are chancellors of a diocese, which would be a very powerful post. Um, but those recommendations were intended to show that way for ordination, and most of us will be in heaven look at that and say, fine, baby. But in our lifetime, we just sit on our hands, or do we seek the ultimate path? And so the LCWR, which had a lot of stake in this, once they began to think in those terms, said, let's take that route. And for me, one of the greatest disappointments of my life in recent years is that more wasn't done with that time. And as I said earlier, John, uh, the plan was we now have these 15 proposals. Some of them were addressed to the bishops, some of them were addressed to the fact plus, and it was our responsibility because for these jobs you need a certain level of education or, or training or experience. So, and then my favorite one of all was that every five years when a bishop went to Rome to give his alumina report to the Pope, one thing that had to be included in the report was what he had done in his diocese to advance the leadership of women. Now, if that had been accepted, we'd be in a real different place. Because the assumption would be the folks like, wait a minute, I haven't heard you talk about this. And there would be, you know, some examples going back and forth. So I do think that this is not about we shouldn't have that as a goal for the church. I'm not making a statement that I think we should not be ordained. I'm making a statement, at least my own statement, is I want to work on something that can help me change now. And, and so that's where I want to put my energies, and that's where I want to encourage other women and men in the church to put their energies into what is possible. And now, with these new decisions of Pope Francis, I just feel like the, the temple veil is torn into. You know, it's, it could be a huge time. But how long will we even hope? And that, you know, that introduces that. So I say we better get on this wagon fast and, and start helping. Margaret? Margaret, I'm just wondering, um, in those 15 recommendations, do you see an opportunity now with the Senate underway? Because as we know, independent groups can Yes. While our own reports of the Vatican are not necessarily going to the diocese, do you have the opportunity to resurface those as part of You know, and that's a really good idea, Margaret. And unfortunately, there's a meeting this week that I will have to miss for the religious service of the following week. And in any event, I can bring those up. When I look at them now, they are dated in the sense that some of these have become the practice, but it's not general. So I think you could take the 15 and say, how would we present that in Buffalo? How would we do it in Omaha? How would we do it in Maine? You know, that sort of thing. But I'd be happy to share that. Somewhere I have a nice little document that lines them up, but um, I can actually leave my copy with you, okay? And then we can exchange back and forth. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sure. Thank you. 
lot of energy into metadata and energy response we can submit to exhibit. But we're also really focused in on how we can work as a diocese here locally to become more synodal to actually have more conversation yeah. in our in our parishes and you know really journey together, lay and journey together. And I'm just curious as to your perception of to make. So I'll quote another church leader. Claudia Dennis Paul Schneider is the president currently of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities. And of course the universities have been asked to gather input from the students and faculty and so on. So he was invited to a meeting in the Bishop's Conference headquarters, which is right in the same neighborhood. And he went and he said to that point he was thinking, I don't know, you know, it's you know, so often you take part of these things and then there's you know, radio silence. But he said he realized coming out of the meeting that mainly the main proof of the sin is we talk to each other in every local church. And then local churches begin to hear the bishops or lay leaders like you. Yeah, everybody is just really distraught of our acts, or people would love to see more of life. And I think that's a very important thing. You know, if the Roman response doesn't meet all of our expectations, is everything lost? Or what changes in our local church because we have this experience? And I would just like to say, because I don't often get the chance, to publicly thank John and Maureen Curley for the courage and the hard work they did to bring to you.